All right. Welcome back to another episode of the beautiful and fun podcast. It's called the NTA podcast. No talks allowed. Refer to us as no talks allowed. Do not ever refer to us as NTA because NTA already exists on the YouTube verse. So anyway, with that said, as usual, today I'm with the wonderful, the smart Josh. I don't know if I've been smart today. I, I've, I've been feeling pretty dumb. <laughs> and of course, Big Bot. Hello. I hear there's a, there's a security risk uh, happening in the uh, VPN sphere. What is that about? Yeah, uh, it's called tunnel vision. It's a uh, problem. Like looking down the tunnel? Yeah, something like Ooh. that. Uh, it's okay. an issue with how DHCP gives out certain parameters. Specifically, we're talking about DHCP option 121, which is defined by some RFC. I can't remember on top of that. Uh, I should, should look at my notes, which are currently closed. But basically what happens is the option 121 basically has specific, you can set alternative routes for specific, uh, specific uh, endpoints, specific host names slash IPs. At which point you can then, if you can basically replace the, the DNS, uh, the DHCP server of the network the user of a VPN is in, you can force them to uh, to put traffic that should go to the, v the the VPN and therefore then to the target target uh, server through the VPN. You can force them to go through your your server, which then captures the traffic and then goes to to the to the target uh, server, which basically bypasses VPN, but you may have heard from it in the media, but it's actually not as bad as people think because not already, as bad. There are already really mitigations in, uh, that are no mitigations, uh, especially for Linux, where you can disable option 121 right off the bat, which basically makes this uh, no, no, non-issue. And second is that the uh, VPN clients should start using uh, network uh, namespaces, which WireGuard in part already supports from what I understand. Okay. Which means uh, the VPN itself would, would be in separate namespace. Those are the same namespaces used by uh, containers, same technology, kernel namespacing. And I did promise that one day I'm going to talk about namespaces more in depth. That episode is still coming. As in, you're still looking it up. As in, as in, we still need to record that episode, put it on the topic list. <laughs> 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 but well, once th this kind of uh, mitigation is put in, this is actually a fix. But this is really only a fix for Linux because no other kernel specifically we're talking about BSDs, Windows, uh, and Mac OS kernel, really have that kind of namespacing that Linux kernel supports. But there are other mitigations, chief among them for users to just not use networks they don't trust. So here we talk about things like you're using VPNs the wrong way. And yeah. it's important to know that even the the those who found the vulnerability or what they call a technique because this is how DHCP is supposed to really work. Uh, they said it's a technique, but it becomes a vulnerability as soon as VPN pro public VPN providers start uh, advertising as a total security. And I'm going to now give word to Josh who will who will explain his opinion on why that kind of marketing is really horrible and wrong. Remember, it's not this just is his horrible opinion. or wrong. It's not just horrible or wrong. It's downright sometimes false advertising. And uh, Yes. Yeah. Now, 
I'm a very big watcher of the YouTubes, right? And whenever a YouTuber comes to a VPN sponsorship segment, I immediately pause the video, I take a deep breath, and you're just like, <laughs> here we go again. Here we go again. And yeah. I hit the resume button, and then they say a world famous name referring to some 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 northern Slavic heritage style nation. And it's just like, okay. I pause the video, I scroll down, I type in a comment, I stopped watching the video at this point here because you mentioned this company, and I'm about to hear a very false advertisement. <laughs> well, <laughs> that is because, something new. Yeah. Now, of course, I'm not going to name this company, but I'm certain that, you know, we have a fairly tech technically minded audience and they might know the one that I'm talking about here, but they're not the only one. I'm talking about, you know, somebody sticking sticking a bear in a tunnel or, you know, it or, you know, like uh, wiring up a shark or or any any of those other ones. But, you know, when they advertise as a total security solution. Yep. You're you also have to kind of figure out how a VPN actually works. All a VPN does is it just directs all the traffic from your device to their server, and then from their server to everywhere else. Yeah, that's literally how it works. So when you're the privacy-minded person and you want to use a VPN in the name of privacy. That's not and you're thing. still yeah. and you're still connecting to a logged in Facebook account or a logged in Google account. You're not being any more private than what you were yes. when you weren't using the VPN. You're actually giving them all the information they need. Uh, in the fact, reason... you're you're giving them more information because now you're giving information to your VPN provider too. Because and who the... knows if they're actually not logging? Yeah. <laughs> also, it's important to know that yes, it can be a privacy solution, but uh, the way it has to be used is very, very, very restrictive and very, yeah. very not something a normal user would do. So you you shouldn't ever log into your accounts. You shouldn't, if you ever visited that website without a VPN, you should never visit it with VPN. Because basically now you give that, that server admin everything you need to know to directly figure out who you are, whether you're using VPN or not. Why? Yeah. Because they're not tracking you via IP addresses, really. They're tracking you about the million parameters you sent to the server. Yeah, because really? on... that's a fingerprint. You can create a fingerprint if you have enough parameters and user agent, many mu multimedia settings that you send along with it. Even even the headers themselves, they, they can all be used to track you in when they combine together. Even hmm. then, like the IS your ISP or VPN provider can can put a what's referred to as a as a super cookie on, on your web browser too. Uh, yeah, this is a cookie that is static, never changes, and you're you can't technically remove it on some devices. That's why yeah. they call it a super cookie because you can't get rid of it. And another reason now, why you shouldn't connect to the same website with and without VPN is because that website can give you a cookie. Hey, yep. Now you're really telling them. I am this person, whether I connect from this IP or this IP. Yeah, and uh, I have been raising this concern for years. And I don't know if I've gotten a VPN company to be aware of it, but, you know, somebody else probably has. So, because a lot of them are now uh, advertising that their, yeah. geo their service is like a geo-relocation service. Yeah. Which now you're just violating terms of terms of service for the, uh, for the for content many, you're trying to watch. For many companies, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For many contents. I, yes, because, you know, Japanese Netflix is great and all, but Japanese, but you're technically not supposed to be watching Japanese Netflix from, yeah. your, from your American household. Yeah. <laughs> now, let's talk about a proper usage of VPN. So, proper usage of VPN. VPN was first created to connect a singular computer to a, to a remote network. So, to create something called an overlay network. And it was one of the first bigger, bigger, uh, bigger overlay network creators we could call it. Now, now we know many other overlay systems for networks. Your Docker containers use an overlay network if you're using yep. Swarm, or Kubernetes uses an overlay network. But a more like a distance wide overlay network can be a VPN, and it's 
Uh, primary usage is really either connecting to different sites, whether it, this is what probably companies you, you are employed by might use to let's say, connect the site A to site B. So they are like, they appear to be on the same network. Or if you are a remote worker or sometimes a remote worker, you may get a VPN access key with which you can access the network and it will look like for you, like you're on the same network as as all the servers back back at HQ. That's what VPNs were primarily made for. That's why we have different standards like IPsec, we have called IPsec the, the, sta the standard for really for peer, uh, for site to site. Then you have OpenVPN, which was primarily used for single computer to to a network. And now we have WireGuard. Yes, which is and, done uh, exactly ending, just much faster. Thank you yeah. for gigabit speeds. It's much faster and it's a much smaller code base, so it's theoretically yes. more secure as well. Yeah. If anything, it's much more maintainable. But uh, honestly, like uh, for like the more average person, I still think that it's worthwhile having a VPN service. You know, because uh, if you can go, if let's, I'll just use a public Wi-Fi Wi-Fi access point as as a primary example. You know, I, have to I, I like I like going to Starbucks occasionally now and then too, and of course uh, sometimes I'll be wanting to search stuff. Uh, the public cell infrastructure in my area is still technically destroyed because you know we had it we had a natural disaster a couple months ago, so uh, all our cell phone connections actually kind of suck. But thankfully, ISPs got everything handled. So uh, there is data service going everywhere, mostly. <laughs> and mostly. I have to disagree. <laughs> and this is this now, is what this this vulnerability hang, showed, hang, because you're on, you're connected to an untrusted network. Yeah. Yes, you are connecting to an untrusted network, but you're establishing the VPN connection. Depending on what VPN client you're using, the client yes. itself, the client yes. itself needs to be able to do. A two-factor check against its own remote server. It's no. like, hey, am I connecting to the correct one? What it needs to do essentially is it's not allow any kind of other routes uh, to do I mean, to happen. That too. Other route. That's what needs to happen before. So to disable tunnel vision, which is to to basically stop tunnel vision from happening, because what tunnel vision actually. Uh, uh, goes around your ne your networking settings by literally using a DHCP server to set all the settings for your network card to be to be. I want all traffic to go through this ser through this gateway instead of any other gateway because it does because the uh, DHCP option one twenty one basically gives you an option to set the most priority alternatives. Uh, to certain endpoints, and if you know how to craft a proper proper host name or proper IP address for all the networks or all the IP addresses, then you potentially can capture all the data. But there is another wrench in that plan. The of wrench that, that that should that is actually more powerful than VPNs, really. It's this thing called HTTPS. Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. It's the thing that, that encrypts all your traffic from your device directly to the server with the same kind it, of encryption it, that is it used depends by... On the, uh, it depends on the websites as well. No. If it's using HTTPS, it's encrypted. If it's using hmm. HTTP, it's not encrypted. That's the point of the S. It yeah. uses uh, uh, encryption. Basically, when you're trying to see, when you're trying to look at an HTTPS connection, realistically, the only thing you can see is the point A and point B, and you can't really yeah. see what's going on in the connection at all. Yeah, uh, that's about the most that you can see with it because you know it is protected. It's protected with that powerful TLS uh, encryption. That, that, that powerful AES two fifty six. You know the 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 encryption type. Yeah, that, the, the that, military that, grade encryption. That, that VPN <laughs> ads call military grade. Which is in yep. reality A AES two fifty six, and it's not really that military grade, which is which is in itself a very big buzzword. So it's not really that good of a it, it's, of a term to someone who knows what they're talking about. It's not an amazing 
thing. But you know, it's it's not the same thing but, as in you know you're not going to get hacked great. within ten seconds. But yeah, it sounds I mean, great. It hits all for the marketing advertisement. It the military for uses it, so it must be good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, we'll, we will have it. We'll have the full report for this uh, security vulnerability posted by Leviathan Security in in our show notes, or if you're watching this on YouTube, in the description down below. Uh, before before we continue, I want to note because I forgot this this technique uh, really only uh, impacts everything besides Android. Yeah, of course. That is, and of course. only thing that has easy disabling is, as far as I understand, Linux. But why it doesn't impact Android? Why? I want to guess why. Because Android always falls back to a, a Google server somewhere. No, because oh. they literally literally don't have support for option 121 in the DHCP <laughs> client. Google, I, okay. Google, Google just didn't, didn't write that code. Google did it because Google was lazy. <laughs> All right. I, either Google was lazy or they knew what they were doing because uh, this is actually not the first time this kind of this kind of usage of DHCP was was talked about as uh, as later on Leviathan uh, security was, was no noticed that there are prior prior researches on this topic of using option one twenty one to 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 get data from a, a clients and now now that I am opening things up, I might actually tell you which which RFC it is. Well, RFC, which one? Option thirty three. Is RFC three four four two. Oh, okay, according uh, to, according oh. to what they see, classless uh, classless static routes, which is exactly what this is. Well, uh, as everybody, uh, as the listeners might have noticed, I haven't chimed in a lot because uh, I'll be honest, networking is not my uh, strong suit. And plug network cable in. Yeah, I, I just <laughs> I know I know how to plug a network cable in when it comes to configuration, whatever. I if it's not pre-configured by the ISP, uh, I just know how to put. The only thing I really know how to do is put IP numbers, IP addresses. <laughs> That's it. If it doesn't work, I call the technician. Hey, it, it's it's saying IP conflict. Who is conflicting with who? Uh, so uh, sorry, I I didn't chime in much, uh, but yeah, it is what it is. Uh, no, you're fine. It, and we don't, and we, and the fact that we don't need VPNs in Lebanon is uh, <laughs> explains it. Basically, we never I, have to deal with VPNs. I'm gonna before we we finish. I'm gonna now we know about Steve. You don't really use VPNs. What about you, Josh? Do you use VPNs? Uh, I do make use of some VPN services, but I don't. I don't just use them all the time. Like uh, I've got. I've got the super special box that connects to a VPN every now and then. It turns on between the hours of midnight and eight in the morning, uh, and that's the only time that box is ever turned on. Uh, other times, you know, it just it's completely turned off. Uh, and then I do have I do make use of a VPN service called Tailscale to connect to to uh, connect for like photo syncing from my phone to my server. Yep, <laughs> and uh, uh, that's about. That's about all the VPN use I really make use of. I'm I'm not like using it like ha how uh, it's advertised to the consumer. I also don't use those public VPNs. I do make use of a VPN uh, that I here use. it comes a special one made by him. To no, <laughs> I'm I'm not a, I'm not that good of a security guy to to write a VPN. That's. Uh. Uh, if I would, I would, I would be using WireGuard anyway, which I am using. It's actually um, pretty easy to do. Yeah, but I'm using a using a service that manages WireGuard for me, and uh, I use it to connect to my network uh, where I have a home home app server, so I can basically access it from anywhere when I'm out and about. And I use mostly use my since I don't use public Wi-Fi. Because I have good cell reception any, almost anywhere. So all I need to do is connect via my phone. So I don't have a need for for public VPN services, really. Yep. Uh, I would like to also note, before we continue on to the next topic, 
that since we're none of us are security people, if we got any information wrong, especially about mitigations, we are sorry, and you should you should look into the actual report by Leviathan Security, which again is in the show notes and description down below. Yep, and we. Uh... I just wanted to say one last thing also is that uh, people should really pay attention what as to what VP, VPN service they're using because if they uh, if they don't and they use the one that's uh, basically caching all their data it's on them yeah. and there are all, there's a lot of questionable VPNs that I read about here and there uh that steal people's data and they use it for for, for their I own mean, if, if you're concerned about that specifically you want to find the vpn service that got raided by the authorities and the authorities didn't find anything and even that that might not be 100 percent yeah. foolproof method yeah don't trust the vpn the don't basically you're just uh you're moving f- uh moving point of trust from your isp to a, to to a some random, random VPN company, and some random server somewhere in the world that might not even be under the that VPN's actual control. It might be but in some random data center, uh, controlled by some random admin. Yep. So, be careful what you choose and uh, why you choose it, and what, how, and why you use it. Exactly, it, it can actually be a real problem. Ultimately, just wonder if you even actually need that internet access to be. Yes, with. that should be the first question you should ask yourself: Do yeah. I need a VPN? And the answer in most cases is no, because it actually increase your privacy all that much only hides your data from one specific group of people and shows it to another, which wouldn't be in the chain in the first place if that didn't happen. Yep. I've got a new idea for a prop. I need to have like one of those cheap little network switches with with an Ethernet cable plugged into it. That way, I can just pull it up and go like, "You need to do this." <laughs> yes. If I you... need, yep. I, I need to buy another switch. That's an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And with this, uh, I I want to talk about. There's a top. There are the two final topics. I uh, are very near and dear to my heart, and this is where I'm going to be chiming in a lot. Uh, this new topic. Uh, this second topic will be about uh, I want to ask the listeners and you guys with me uh, how serious are you about the uh, about the distribution you're using because there's a lot of I see a lot of people using a distro and I don't and whenever as soon as a uh, as an issue hits they they start complaining and they start going around and finding uh, excuse uh, calling it an excuse to jump to jump ship and go to another distro instead of doing the work it, like when somebody loves something like when i love something i work my behind off uh just to uh to make sure that this thing works to uh to it to the best of its abilities and to, for it to be stable. Like I'm using Arch, for example, and BigBot will have a million different things to say about Arch, but uh, I use Arch and I contribute upstream as much as I can. I When I use an AUR package, for example, I contribute to that, uh, to that uh, package uh, upstream. Uh, if I use a, for example, a KDE, uh, uh, let's say uh, plasmoid if it has an issue i go upstream i report the issue and more times than than i can count they 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 were fixed within hours or days but if if we were serious and about when we say we love this distro we adore this distro this is the distro for me you would be uh, helping it grow and instead of complain going on social media saying oh it broke now i need to go to another distro because the developers are idiots they break it instead of making it work did you know that the entire linux is built on our 
shoulders. We are the guinea pigs. What I mean by guinea pigs is we are the ones using those developers' work. The uh, and then whenever we hit a snag, we have to report it to them so they can fix it. If we don't do that, then we don't really love the distro we're using. We're just using it and just words, words, words. Actions speak louder than words. You have to do the action. You have to do the minimum to, 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 towards something you love. If you don't love it, then don't say you love it. Because, or if you don't uh, uh, contribute upstream, don't say you love the distro. Just say, I like that distro. But if it breaks, I don't, I'm, I don't care for contributing upstream. I mean, if it breaks, I use something else. Then you don't really love it. You're using it just because it works for you. And as soon as it breaks, you hop off. And it's not wrong. It's just the way people, uh, the way uh, the way people uh, uh, react when uh, not react. Uh, the way that people show how much they love their distro, they say, "I love it, I love it, I love it," but they don't do anything about it. Like I can give you an ex a positive example: somebody who's doing actually the right thing, Zany, for example, our buddy Zany. He loves NixOS. Okay, now he's using something else, uh, <coughs> Mac. But um, when he was using uh, Nix, he was contributing upstream. He was helping it grow. He was making to helping users learn more about Nix OS. He was doing the right thing. Are you doing the right thing? Sorry, yes. I talked a little bit too much. Well, Big Big Pod is part of this whole uh, project that's uh, pushing forward, like the whole Fedora Atomic Desktop thing. Last I checked. Yeah, Big Pod is another yeah. example of the right thing to do. Yeah, I contribute to Universal Blue. I, I am. And a Josh member. here is a, a contributor as well to Gentoo and other uh, other. Dis he even contributed upstream to Fedora. He got banned for it, but he <laughs> did. I, I'm actually not banned from Fedora. I'm oh, not anymore. Uh, no, not, <laughs> I'm not banned from Fedora. Th uh, th thanks, uh, the Fedora committee, for like taking time to actually listen to what I was trying to tell them. Uh, but uh, there are some distros that I am banned from from contributing to. <coughs> Arch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ar Arch being one of them, and of uh... course Solus <laughs> being another. <laughs> because oh, somebody has opinions. And did not agree with my opinions that I also have. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, now I want, I want. Here's, here's the, the, the little last thing I want to say. I want the listeners to, to really send us emails or, or, or people who are watching it on YouTube. Send, let us know in the comments. Do you really love your distro? Are you contributing? Because if you are, let us know if you're uh, how you're contributing upstream and in what areas. Because this is a very good discussion subject. Do me a favor, by the way, and look through the Linux kernel uh, in the Intel in the Intel XE driver uh, and see if you can find the comment that says Josh was here. <laughs> you were there. I was in the kernel. Yes. Okay, so this is this is above and beyond, guys. You heard it here first. Uh, but yeah, please do let us know. Uh, I'm I'm not I, I I don't mean to be mean, but it, there's a lot of people who who I they don't they nag me. <laughs> Let's put it this way. There's a better way to put it. They nag me. They say we love, we love, we love. And as soon as they hit a snag, I see them going back to Windows. Like th there was a guy I met w a, a while ago. Uh, he was like, "I installed Ubuntu. I uh, I uh, I up I updated. It broke. I'm back on Windows. Windows is the best." <laughs> I remember a certain Steve here installing Fedora, upgrading it to Rawhide, saying that he absolutely loved it, and then immediately leaving it. Uh, no, I did. I did report issues upstream. Oh, okay. 
I did report some issues upstream and not in English, in French, because I know a guy who uh, uh, internally in, over at Fedora, but on the French team. So uh, I did report a few issues upstream and I talked to people, but uh, I didn't end up using it because um, I wanted my arch back, my beloved arch. I, I, I can't live without Arch. He's got to celebrate is... the letter A. And then he's got to put it in a NeoFetch script that, that opens up whenever fast he the terminal. That way, okay, fast a fetch. fast fetch script. So that, so that whenever he opens up fast fetch, it just gives him that big letter A. And he goes, I accomplished something, Internet. I installed Arch Linux. Yes. Uh, if I don't see my A, my beloved A, I, something is wrong. I know I can do it with DistroBox. Some people in the comments might say, hey, you got DistroBox. You can use any other distro, but you can still have Arch uh, as a DistroBox. Yes, I know, but I do work on things that require me to be on Arch, not on an Arch container. So, um, and to prove, really. to prove to you how much I love Arch, I am working day and night on scripts that, that are so amazing. Just see their upcoming scripts I'm working on with someone. Uh, and no, it's not ChatGPT. Uh, with an actual person that will do so many so things. So big chat then. <laughs> no, a real person. And uh, I'm going to describe it as simply as I can. I am I'm working on my own version of the Arch, Arch install profile. Oh, so that means that when I uh, download the Arch ISO and... Uh, enter arch install a zero linux will be a profile option no there's there won't be it well zero linux it won't be the distro zero linux but yeah of course i work under the zero linux umbrella so whatever i work on is gonna have zero xero at the beginning so uh, i already created uh, finished work on the plasma multi-profile because my plasma script has four profiles minimal uh, uh, complete, custom, and selective. So uh, I finished. I'm done. the The script is uh, online. anybody can use. It's on. You can check it out on my website. But uh, I'm gonna be working with someone on the Hyperland uh, profile and XFCE GNOME. We're, we're gonna work on on a few profiles and maybe. Maybe we're going to bring more profiles, ones that haven't existed on the Arch install, and I don't think will ever exist. So, this is how much I love Arch. I'm contributing upstream, my sweat and tears. Now, I have a bit of an ask for our community, and really the Linux community as a whole, if not yeah. really the open source community. Please. Do not harass, attack, bully uh, developers who ask for financial support, who ask for donations, who who try to monetize their open source creations. Please do not bully them. It's yes. It is it is free and open source, but at the not day, as in free beer. <laughs> but in the, the day, it's not free beer. At the day, it's not timeless work. Doesn't doesn't. It takes time, which could they could have used on something possibly even more productive, possibly something that would make them money, but they're not. They're putting putting it to help everyone. Yes. We can we can thank them by by not bullying them and possibly if you use that software, if you use that library, giving them few few dollars every so often. Thank you for transitioning so well to that uh, to that topic because this is a very important topic to me because I am one of them. Uh, I am one of the bullied uh, contributors. And I'm uh, sorry to hear it. And I think many, many of our listeners will agree with my sentiment. Yes. Sorry. Uh, but uh, I, I have been bullied many, many times, especially now. Uh, after I mentioned uh, the fact that Zero Linux, the distro, might be making a comeback 
in case you haven't heard, yes, it might be making a comeback. I did mention it on my previous live stream because somebody asked the question. They were they were like, "Are you? Will you ever consider bringing back Zero Linux? Because they loved it and and they are still on it, but they're having issues because I'm no longer maintaining it. They 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 were wondering if I was going to bring it back. I was like, if I am to bring it, to bring Zero Linux back, it's going to be number one behind a paywall because I am in Lebanon and I I have no means to make uh, you need a living. money to make food. Yeah, I yes. need money to make food, and uh, the situation in Lebanon is not easy to find work. And I've been applying left and right, and nothing. I've, I've received nothing but rejections uh, because I am in Lebanon. So even online work jobs I cannot find because there's the word Lebanon attached to my location. So um, there's no other way to make uh, to put food on the table. So I'm trying to find ways, and one of the ways is charging uh, by charging for my distro. And I'm not going to be charging a million bucks or a hundred bucks. I'm gonna be charging ten bucks for uh, and. 10 bucks and how much ever. So it's an open starting from not, not, uh, 10 bucks onwards. Uh, so I got attacked for it. And the specific reason I got attacked and bullied was because I mentioned, uh, I said, like, I want to see, I want to test and see how much interest there is in bringing back Zero Linux. Because if it's, it's there is no, not much interest, if it's only three, four people requesting it, it's not worth my time. Yeah. So uh, what I did was I started a uh, charity sh uh, uh, charity fund or a fundraiser, uh, a, f a fundraiser, and I set a goal. It's a hypothetical goal. It's I, I need way more than what I set, but it's just a hypothetical goal. It's fifteen hundred dollars. I was like, if I reach that uh, that target, that goal. Then I'll see that there's enough interest to guard, uh, to to allow me to uh, bring it to bring Zero Linux back. If I don't reach it, then okay, that's it. Uh, every penny I had raised on whatever I raise will go towards the channel, will go towards other projects, but not Zero Linux because there, there's not enough interest. It, uh, I got attacked for it, and they were like. Oh, you're so you're charging for something uh, like uh, that isn't even out yet that you're just considering putting out. I was like, yeah, I need money to work on zero Linux. It's not like I I, I pay for. It. It's not like uh, the electricity I have is for free, or the the phone I have is for free, or the internet I'm using to do all the research is for free, right? Uh, if I had a job, then yeah, I would. You would have a point, but I don't have a job. I can't get a job. I, I'm trying, so I'm doing my best, so so not to ask for uh, for uh, contri uh, financial contributions. But until the situation improves, I have no other choice. So uh, I get attacked for it, left and right, because it's false, and everybody hears the word whenever. When people hear the word free, to them it, mean, it automatically means free beer. And this is wrong. We work our asses off to bring yeah. you things that make you happy. You didn't ask for them. We understand that. But if we didn't do that, you wouldn't be uh, finding things that uh, you enjoy. So... And we're not forcing you. That's the other thing. We're not forcing anyone. We're, if you like our work, then the minimum you can do is throw a few bucks. We're not asking you for hundreds of bucks. You're just a couple of bucks here and there. They go a long way. Because we've had, there's a. We've had this discussion many a times. <clears throat> yes. Yep. And uh, there is one big example of what happens when uh, people don't support projects. Uh, at all and yeah. it, it was big news and it came out december 9th 2020 from a red hat blog post or well not red hat but centos where they announced the end of centos and the continuation of centos stream yes which uh, is now dying <laughs> uh it's not is stream dying i don't think stream is dying I don't stream think so. is uh going out uh 
what they called end of life. I mean, yeah, the current version probably. Yeah, the current version mm. is because you know they're because... they're getting ready for that Red Hat ten development cycle. Yes. Yeah. yeah so the stream isn't dead, <clears throat> but, uh, and people have to realize, and and I'm sorry to be beating a dead horse here when I'm talking about how Red Hat killed killed CentOS. Red Hat killed CentOS for a reason. Because they didn't see any reason to continue CentOS. Because there CentOS was no was return on investment. There, there was no return from it. Yep. And if there's no return, why would you bother? And this brings me to another point. There is another reason we should help our uh, the developers of this where, or of any open source thing, whether it be to to get to show our interest to give them a return, but more importantly, for singular developers or or small teams like uh, that are building it for for their own pleasure for the because they want to contribute back to community we should yeah. help them because me, most of them do that kind of work at their work this is this is their afternoon they could be they could be out with their family could be doing anything else whatever they wanted they, they're helping you and that and we should help them for no other reason but to to give them something with which they can maybe even avoid mental issues, burnout. And how would money help them avoid it? By by allowing them to cut back hours on on their actual job, allowing them to at least partially open source become their their work. Yep. yep. That would that would allow them to live a better life to live on their to live on their own of their own accord to and to work on something they want to work on open source yep that or if you don't have money to contribute you can you can attempt to contribute code instead exactly this is another now, thing i was going to mention uh steve have you ever received a pull request on any of your zero linux projects in the past that's why I wanted to mention it because a lot of people a lot of people prefer to do it via chat because yeah. they think th they think they would get solutions faster. Uh, th sometimes they do, but most of the times they don't. Because do you, remember, do you remember the first time that happened? Right. First thing, first the, time the, that the, the the first time somebody else came with a resolution to an issue you that Zero Linux was having. Yeah. How did that make you feel? Did that did that just like give you a sudden moment of like this guy this guy knows about it? Yeah, it made yeah. Me, it made me feel like like I I was uh, uh, making uh, making a dent somewhere. Yeah. Now, it, of course, it didn't put food on your table. No. But you know, it 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 gave you a feeling of satisfaction. Go like, hey, I did a thing, and this guy helped me make the thing better. And it possibly lo uh, lowered your workload, which is that's it. Lowered it lowered my workload. I've had contributions before to to zero Linux, uh, but uh, and the people should know that contributions they come and go. So yeah. let's. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna give a very simple example. A person came. He contributed code. It was such good code. It was so complex. It was above my pay grade, as they say. But they disappeared. And I, had, I no longer had any contact from him. I couldn't contact him. I couldn't find him anywhere. He wasn't replying. So he contributed code. I was happy. Yay! But it was so above my pay grade. So when if people have issues in the future with that, the, with that code, yeah, I won't be able to explain it a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't stick around and uh, and fix it because it's something that I don't un understand myself. Yeah. yeah. So this is this is the this, this is called but... drive by contributions. Yeah. Drive by contributions, and I lo I like those as long as I can understand them. But when they contribute something way above my pay grade, and that's when I uh, when I started limiting the amount of contributions I was yeah. accepting because I didn't want to reach that point anymore. And the important thing is yeah, that most contributions, any project receive that aren't from the core maintainers of the project are drive-by contributions. Not many actually stick around to contribute 
multiple times. They contribute yeah. when they have issues and they know the fix, so contribute it and then go away. Now, uh, what if what if they can't contribute code? Contribute documentation. 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 Yep. Go to wiki.whateveryourdistrois.com and just write stuff. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. I guarantee you, nobody knows uh, some of the tricks that you know on like getting you know hardware acceleration working properly in Firefox. Because you know some distros still don't do that, <laughs> or or you know uh, how to install this packaging actually configure it. Some distros don't document that, but they have the package available. Or you know uh, you go to like the wiki.archlinux.org and you find that the wiki is actually wrong for so- for once about something. You can fix that. An yep. alter an alternative really is just tell people that you use it. And yep. when somebody when somebody's posting that they're having an issue with it, you attempt to help them. Yes. Or you attempt to help them find out uh, get gather more information that way somebody else can come and help them because you know sometimes you don't even know what their issue is so you just tell them where to find the log file. Yeah. <laughs> and I think we we bashed with uh with this proverbial hammer onto your heads enough. So let's let's uh, talk about let's co- socials. So you can you can check us out on uh, our preferred medium of of uh, delivery of podcasts, which is which is mm. RSS feed, uh, which can be found on our our page, which we self host. Thank you, Josh. You're at welcome. show.tagspace.com, uh, which is a scastopod, as we talked in previous ep- one of the previous episodes. And there you can find our RSS feed or even listen through Castopod. And we, we also, each of us have socials. You can yep. contact us directly. They should be in in the show notes or if, you, if you're watching us over on YouTube, they should appear right below here somewhere. Somewhere, <laughs> I, I'm and certain. I'm certain that if that if our editor gets really fancy, they'll start glowing like RGB colors and just start rotating around. That way, you can't possibly read them ever. But you know, we're not we're not at that stage yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can also send us a, an email over at uh, Josh. What's the email? <laughs> oh, it, it's just simply contact at tuckspace dot com. I should have known. I, I read it. A- Every week, couple of times when I, when I'm editing things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's been it's it's it was a good one today. Uh, it got me. Uh, it allowed me to get a few frustrations off my chest. Uh, but hopefully, people understand. And uh, of course, as uh, Big Pod said, uh, you will find all the links uh, in the show notes and everywhere else. Uh, and for me, uh, I'm gonna say this by before I uh, as uh, in closing, uh, I could really uh, use your support. And the the whole episode, there are, there will be haters uh, who who are going to say, "Oh, they just did this episode to ask for money and contributions or whatever." No, it's not that. But in my case, I could really use the, your financial uh, help because I am currently dry, dry, completely dry. I have no way of making money, no way of putting food on the table. We're barely surviving with uh, bare nickels. Uh, right now, it's getting bad, uh, from bad to worse. So uh, if you can, uh, if you have seen Zero Linux somewhere, if you've used it, and, or you have seen my scripts or used my scripts, uh, make sure uh, you'll find you'll find all the ways to contribute me uh, to com- contribute to me on uh, on my website. So, or if you want to contribute to me uh, privately for my private, uh, because I have a separate private fund, uh, fundraiser, uh, it's on uh, fundraiser, basically. Uh, you'll, you'll find that on techzero.com, T-E-C-H-X-D-R-O.com. Uh, you'll find it in the contact. Uh, this is for uh, life-related stuff. It's unrelated. I separated it completely from Zero Linux. So uh, there is for my cause, basically, for, for me to be able to put food on the table. The, uh, the others are for to, uh, to contribute to Zero Linux. 
uh, I separated the two. I had to separate the two because I can't keep mentioning Lebanon when it com when it comes to Zero Linux. When Zero Linux is Zero Linux, and for my situation in Lebanon, it's a separate fundraiser. So either or, you uh, if you want to uh, uh, show me some love, cut, throw uh, throw a few cup uh, a couple of bucks here and there. Uh, this is how you can do it. so. Thank you uh, so much, guys. And uh, with this one, I bid you good night. Good night. Goodbye.